Ecclesiastes says that there is nothing new under the sun. But when you find a small group of men and women, believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, not a part of any church, who come together in a hotel room, who could have stayed home and seen the big football games, but didn't. I think maybe you've got something new under the sun. We are not churchmen. We're Christians. No one can bind us as to what we ought to do, how we ought to act. Some people sometimes think we're too happy. We can't help that. We are happy. Blessed, that is, happy is the man whose sins are forgiven and mine are forgiven. Blessed, that is, happy is the man whose sins have been covered and mine are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Those words mean happy. And we are happy. We hope it will show up in our faces, in our actions. Won't go into that any further. I'll get into a long study. Now, get it straight. Take God at His word. And before taking off to make the swim, he greased himself all over. Just covered his body with some grease that he had. Large water was, I don't know. Now, I thought they did that to help him to get through the water. He slipped through a little faster. But he said, no, the swimmer does that to protect their bodies from the impurities of the water. Now, is there something that will protect us from the impurities of the world? If it is, it's this, the word of the living God. Believe that? Practice that? Believe will do it. Is there anything that will purge my thinking after I have uh, been thrown with this and heard it? Of all kinds of blasphemy and so on, is there anything then that will purge my mind? Yes. The word of the living God. Now we believe that. And we practice that. And you and I should be very, very careful if we do not get our testimony and our witness linked up with just something that is nothing more than odd or peculiar, even though it could be supported biblically. Or else we'll get marked out. And what we want to be marked out for, what we want to be marked out is, as is men who are personal, individual believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. Not that we believe because our fathers did, although my father was a believer. Not that we did because our mothers, you just happened to be brought up in this. I was brought up in this. But at the age of 18, I had a personal encounter with the truth. And this truth concerned the Lord Jesus Christ. And I became a personal believer in Him. People often want to know what I'm identified with. Baptist, Methodist, Catholics, you can't identify me with anything at all except the Lord Jesus Christ. The only thing on earth I belong to is the automobile club. I belonged to that for many years. And the reason I am identified with the automobile club is that they'll come when I have a flat tire. And uh, they will come when I run out of gasoline. And I've established my right to call. I'm a member. It's paid out. I've established my right to call. I've also established my right to call upon the Lord Jesus Christ within the limits of this dispensation of grace. I've established my rights to call upon Him. Uh, I'm identified with Him. My life is merged with Him. I'm not everything I ought to be. You know that. 
I'm not everything out of me. Although if you want to put a detective on my trail, have him follow me night and day, I don't think that you'll find anything that warrants any very serious criticism. But I do tell you this, in, any, in many things we all offend, and if any man says that he is without sin, he lies, the truth is not in him, so I'm not going to sit here and lie to you. But I am going to tell you that I am related to the Lord Jesus Christ, and the relationship is that He is my Savior. See, I don't talk about I gave my heart to Him. Whatever that means, I don't know. I've got my heart yet. Pumping away, pumping away. And anyone can make what they want to make out of that. I believe in the record God gave of His Son. That's what I do, and I'm a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm identified with Him. And just like Mrs. Sellers is my wife, Jane Hancock is my daughter, Gabe Monheim is my good friend, Jesus Christ is not my brother, not my sister, of course not, not my father. Jesus Christ is my Savior. I need a Savior. I wouldn't want to be without a Savior in life. Anyone knows I wouldn't want to come up and face death without a Savior. And if I do face death, there's going to be no hurrying about trying to get someone in to get me ready. One time when I was stricken with a bad gallbladder suddenly that became gangrenous, it was that far, and the blood corpuscle count showed that I was in the greatest danger. And uh, the doctor said to Mrs. Sellers, he'll be in the x-ray most of the afternoon, you better go home get a little rest, and she did. And the nurses were trying on Sunday afternoon, and the staff was trying to arrange for a surgical team, and anybody acquainted with the hospital knows that's not easy to do. My own doctor was on the job, and he was trying to make the arrangements. The people in the hospital were exercised, they were good people. It was a Roman Catholic hospital happened to be. One little nurse who was a very sweet girl, she was very much troubled about me, said, Mr. Sellers, don't you have any friends? I said, I've got thousands of friends all over the country. And she said, well, why aren't they here? I said, well, first place, they don't know that I'm here. And uh, I said, I really don't want them here. And she said, well, don't you have a minister? I said, no, I have no minister. Well, would you like me to buy, try to get one? I said, no, I don't need any. She kept coming back with ideas. I said, now listen, honey. And being as old as I am, you know, you can call a young girl honey. It doesn't mean anything about it. It did mean something. They are honeys. But anyway, I said, now listen, honey. Don't you worry about me. I said, Jesus Christ is my saint. He's been my Savior, and I told her the number of years at that time. Anything that happens to me, I'm all right. The only person I want down here is my wife, and she's on her way, and everything's going to be all right with me, and if anything does happen, you tell all these folks around here that when that man died, he died with the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. So, if I should come face to face with a heart attack, you don't have to run around finding priests to do something for me or a minister. These men are mediators between God and man. I have the mediator. I've got the big fellow. I've got the real Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. The only one that can do it. He's the friend that's sticking closer than the brother. And so, I want every one of you to be an outstanding Christian. An outstanding believer. Even an outstanding student of the Word. You're needed for the days to come. Let's not get hung up on a lot of strange and difficult things. Let's not get too troubled about Armageddon. 
The Mark of the Beast, 666, The Antichrist. Oh, I've got into word about them. I think I've given you material this week on those subjects that's been in advance. And I trust it's been helpful to many of you, but let's get exercised about this one who is our Savior. If you're looking for something to believe, you ought to have something to believe about him. The Gospel of John was a book that God inspired for a purpose. When he said to John Wright, this man who must have had many friends spoke to his friends even as I'd speak to you and say, get me parchments, get the ink and get the stylus. Uh, God said to Wright, so his friends scurry about and they come with the parchments that are available. Things were scarce in that day. Some bring the styluses, the pens that they use. Others brought the ink. Usually it was the ink that they got out of the octopus. You know, that's the India ink that we use in the drawing room. If any of you ever worked in the drawing room, which I did at one time. This India ink, the real India ink, it got right out of the octopus. And so they would get that. John began to write. Now, let's look for a while at a few things that he wrote, because when he got through, he said, many other things are written, many other things happen, not written in this book. But these are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, believing he have life through his name. Now, if Tonight, someone would steal all my money, and I wouldn't have a penny tomorrow morning. Well, I'd just get on the phone here and call the friends I have and say, I need money. I've been robbed. And there's not a one of you that would not share with me what you have and say, forget about paying it back. I believe you would do that. I don't know you all that well, but I believe you would do that. And, of course... If I would lose my clothing, go to the store and buy some. If I had the means. Not, I'm sure I could get into one of Leon's suits. <laughs> and, uh, but, uh, we'd get by. Of course, if I'd lose my life, this thing that's the difference between me and a dead person, you know, I stood up there in the uh, waiting lounge of the uh, Ozark Airlines in Kansas City. And I looked out on the truck, and they were going to load a casket. Uh, it was all covered up with uh, dark green canvas, the type of a covering how the airlines put over a casket when they ship one. I knew that there was a dead body in that casket that was going on the plane that I was going on. I could see the whole operation, and uh, that there was a dead man in that. Now, what was the difference between that man and this man? Had to buy a ticket for him before he could ride, you know that? You have to buy a ticket for a corpse. He doesn't sit in the seat, put him in the baggage compartment, I had a seat. The real difference was that life had gone out of him. Not his soul, life had gone out of him. And uh, life was in me. And if God would withdraw his spirit, even his breath, his life, all place would perish before him. But there was a dead man. And uh, life had gone out. I do hope that he's got another life to take the place of this. So that when God makes the judgment, He'll speak his name. And he will live in a world on this earth where God governs, where God rules, where everything that's wrong will be right. And everything that's false will give way to the truth. And all iniquity will stop her mouth. And sinners will come to an end. That's what I wish. Well, the book was written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, 
believing have life through his name. The book begins like this, in the beginning was the word. John's Gospel, chapter 1, verse 1. And everyone knows that that sounds a great deal like the first book of the Hebrew Scriptures. In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Same verse. Now, this tells us that the beginning, a burden, pardon me, that the Word was with God. Now, everyone knows what a word is, but if you ask them, they can't define it. They just give you an illustration. They say, book, that's the word. No, sir, book is a symbol of this. And I can say book and express this. And if it's gone, I say, I've lost my book. I've lost my book. You all know what I mean. You won't go looking for a pad. You won't go looking for glasses, a sheet of paper. No. You look for a book. A book is the expression of an idea. It's a symbol of a thought. And in the beginning was the expression of God. The expression of God and the expression was with. But the Greek word is pros. And pros means toward. As if I would say, toward me, a certain woman is my wife. In relationship to me, she's my wife. And what this says is that in the beginning was the expression. The expression was in relationship to God and the expression was God. And any Jehovah Witness who tells you that this says the expression was a God, that fellow does not know what he was talking about. I have examined the Greek here very carefully in this. I know that the word God there is a predicate noun. And wherever you find a predicate noun in Greek, you will never find a definite article. Never, no matter what it is. If it uses a predicate noun, that's just a rule of Greek. And of course there's no definite article here, so they put in a indefinite article and say the word was a God. And the last one I talked to, I took him to Isaiah and I showed him where... That Jehovah said, is there a God beside me? I know not any. And yet I said, you fellows come up with another God. How do you do this? Got two gods on your hand. You can't do that. To us there is one God. And only one God. Now, the same was in the beginning, not with, but toward. In relationship to God. I don't know why more translators just don't face that up. Everybody knows that pros is toward. Our shortened form is pro. If you're pro-Russian, you're toward the Russians. You see. If you're pro this or that, you're toward them or in relationship to them. But they translated with and then create a difficulty. Now, this was the creator. And it says in the third verse, all things came into existence, were made, should be a little stronger, the Greek is stronger, but all things came into existence by Him, the Word. And without Him, not one thing came into existence that now exists, the Word. Now, back in the Old Testament, it says, in the beginning, Elohim, the plural form, the majestic plural. We call it the royal plural sometimes, like the editorial we that is often used. Uh, in uh, our uh, papers, magazines. But uh, Elohim, in the beginning, Elohim created the heavens and the earth. Well, this one here that's called the Word has to be the same as Elohim. If Elohim created the heavens and the earth, and if all things were made by the Word, then the Elohim that did the creating in the beginning has to be the same as this Elohim who is the expression of God. Now, they are the same. The Elohim of the Old Testament is the word of the Gospel of John, the Logos. See? 
Now, in him was life, the source of life. There is life in me, but the source is not in me, and it can go out. You can strike a match, and you'll get some light, but that light is going out very quickly. Better drop it before it burns your fingers. The light was the light of men. And the light shined in the darkness. And the darkness couldn't distinguish it. For I don't care how dark it becomes. How wicked men become. How careless they become. How unbelieving they become. That light will still be shining. And even in a great city like New York, Chicago, that light will open the eyes of men. And they will see in Jesus Christ the one who expresses, the one who declares, the one who represents, the one who interprets God, and therefore is God. Now, uh, in a book that was written so that men might believe, you wouldn't start out with your name first like Paul did in his epistles. But now John must introduce himself. And he's going to do it by speaking in the third person, a thing that he will do over and over and over again in this epistle. He'll do it at least uh, seven, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. He'll do it at least eight times in this epistle. I've got them all marked in my notes. I'm not going to give them to you. He'll speak in the third person. He'll speak about the one who leaned on Jesus' breast at the last Passover. And there's no doubt about it. A lot of us, the writer of this book, John. And then in the sixth verse it says, There came to be a man commissioned of God. Yes. What was he commissioned for? Go out and raise the dead? No. Not here. He was commissioned to write. An authorized to write. There came to be a man commissioned of God whose name, John. Not was, but John. That's the writer of this book. Not John the Baptist. Don't bring him in yet. You haven't even got the incarnation yet. So don't get John the Baptist in here too early. The same for a witness. That is, he was commissioned to produce a witness. That's why he was commissioned, to produce a witness that all men through it, the witness, might believe. That's the way God was going to set it up. That he was going to cause John to bring forth a testimony, a witness. You know, like a man sits in the witness chair in a court, and they take it all down. Now they've got a witness. The man can pass out the picture. Now they've got a testimony. The testifier can die. But they've got it. It's down. So uh, God wanted to produce a witness. So that all men through this might believe. So, since all men should read the Bible as believers, read them as believers, they should start with the Gospel of John. This is a book which is not like any other book. And sure, if I were reading Gone with the Wind, I don't know how that came to my mind, but just because it's such a big book, I'd start with the first word. No doubt about it. Sometimes in the newspapers we turn to the sports pages first. Why? Because we're more interested in sports. But uh, he who is going to study the Bible, he had better start and become familiar with this book that will guarantee him life and qualify him as a believer so that he reads the book as a believer. Or he'll stumble on everything he'll find. Boy, he'll stumble when he gets to Noah's Ark. Why? Because he hasn't got God in there yet. You put God in the Ark, and there's no trouble at all. No trouble with the animals. No trouble with uh, feeding the animals. No trouble with anything if you put God in the Ark, and God was in the Ark. Didn't he say to Noah, Come thou and all thy house in the Ark. That same as I'd say, Come into this room. Not go into it, come into it. Because I'm in here. Come on in, we say, when we're inside. Or if we want somebody to go first, we say, go in. God said, come down all the house of the ark. 
He was in the ark. That just takes care of everything. So the ark doesn't trouble me. The flood doesn't trouble me if it's written. I'm a very simple believer. Not simple-minded, but just a very simple believer. God says it, and I believe it. Now, uh, he was not that light. The writer was not the light. John. John was just uh, sent to bear witness of that light. And the light he was sent to bear witness of was the true light. Get it straight. Believe it. Don't stumble here now. He was the true light that lightens every man that comes into the world. Don't talk to me about a second chance. If the true light enlightens every man that comes into the world, that's the chance. And you know it is. And if he's going to kick that aside, why should there be some second chance for him? You say, but that isn't enough. That's all God needs. And God can judge on that basis. He that is faithful in that which is least is faithful in that which is much. And there's no use to think that uh, if he had some greater light, he would believe. I have people tell me, well, if I could see some of these miracles like the Bible tells about, I'd believe. Nobody can say that. In the first place, you cannot believe unless God generates faith within you, because even he who believes that Jesus is the Christ is generated, King James Version says born, is generated of God. The Greek word is gnao. And anybody knows that a gen word means to generate. He that believeth that Jesus the Christ is generated of God. Now, uh, he lightens every man that comes in the world. Don't ask me how he does it. Don't ask me how he reaches out to those aboriginals in the Philippines and South America, Borneo, gives them enough light that they know that above their own being there is a being that is supreme. And the testimony of every missionary who have gone among primitive tribes is that they found them knowing the existence of a supreme being but worshiping demons. And they've asked them why. Oh, because he's good. He won't hurt us. We've got to appease these so they, they won't hurt us. And that's what the missionaries usually found. When the missionaries got to China, first ones went to China, they thought those poor ignorant Chinese wouldn't know the difference between right and wrong. And they found a higher moral code and a better moral code and they left the United States. A much higher moral code. Where'd they get it? The true light that lightens every man that cometh in the world. And again I say to you, that all that God expects of any man right now today is that he shall fear the one who is supreme and do what he knows to be right and refrain what he knows to be wrong. And one thing I know that is right that maybe my friend in Africa doesn't know is that this is the work of God that you believe on him whom God has sent. So when it comes to this plan of salvation, I'm just not going to talk about your sins. <laughs> That's all Billy Graham seemed to be able to talk about, is the sins of people. I'm telling you about a Savior from sin. I'm putting the emphasis where it should be. I'm going to give you something to believe, and you can do what you please with it. Add it to your faith, or start with it. I can't do anything about it, but just proclaim the Word. It's only required of stewards that they be found faithful, and God never told me to save a soul. Did He tell you, save souls? No, you couldn't do it if you tried. All God told you to do is herald the word. It's only required of stewards they be faithful. I don't have to be successful. I don't have to be successful. Nobody's going to be ashamed of me. If I'm not successful. I'm not going to be ashamed. I'm a workman that has no need to be ashamed. Remember, maybe I told you about the Presbyterian minister that wrote to me and said, he heard me on the radio, we've been in school together wrote to me and said, I know what you say is true, that the dead are dead, but you're not going to get anywhere preaching that. You know, he was right. I never did get anywhere preaching that. But I'm still preaching, because that's the truth. That is the truth. All right. He was in the world, 
Now, here's an important thing. Uh, you see, we have the planet. That's the Earth. We have the world. That's the system, the order, arrangement, ecology, environment, whatever you want to call it, all goes together. If it wasn't here, this Earth would be nothing. You couldn't live on Mars. You couldn't live on the moon. It doesn't have the world for you to live on. It's a good solid place. The astronauts stood there. Our satellite seems to be set down there very solidly on Mars. But they put you down there, you'd probably explode. No, I just mean that. You'd probably explode. The men that went to the moon, they had to take some of our world along as much as they could. Carried on their backs when they walked. They were carrying a little bit of our world. Very important. Now, this world is a very complex thing, so complex that no man can even begin to explain it. Oh, I like to think about it sometimes. It's raining out now. And do you know as that rain comes down through, it picks up nitrous gases from the air. And that's the best thing in the world that you can ever put in the soil. And anyone will tell you that your grass will do a hundred times better from one rain than it will do from all the water you can squirt on it. See? And that's just because it picks up that acid, this nitric acid, which is akin to nitrogen. It picks it up out of the air, brings it down, and that will dissolve earth and even dissolve rock. So if the plants can take it in, see, and put it into itself. And that's why the rain does not That's all part of our world. That's all part of our system. Oh, it's a wonderful thing. And I could go on into a million and one things to tell you just how wonderful this world is and God made it. Now, when you make a thing, a say or organized thing, the question would be, what would you put into it? What would you put into it? Let us say here that uh, Brother Lewis and I were going in business. He says, well, I'll put in 5,000. I say, I'll put in 5,000. Nice. Maybe he hasn't got it. Maybe I haven't got it. But we're just talking big figures. Now the time comes the business needs more money. And he loves the business, we'll say. It's doing all right. But, but I don't care. I don't like it. So he says, uh, we ought to have $10,000 more in this business. That's not me. <laughs> no, I put all I'm going to put into that. Do you know that God put His Son into this world? I'm not talking about the Incarnation. I'm not talking about it. God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. He put His Son into it. That doesn't say He gave Him to die. All that's telling us that He put His Son into this world so that Whosoever in this world believes on him could have Eonian or eternal life. That's why God put his son into the world. And all the way from the time of Adam, the son was in the world. And when Adam sinned, he heard a voice saying, Where art thou, Adam? Which I've always felt. Where do you stand now, Adam? You've eaten of the tree. Where do you stand? God knew where he was. But where do you stand? Adam didn't have anything to stand on. Shame to appear in the presence of God. God made him coats of skins and clothed him. And if you ever make a coat out of skin, some animal will have to shed his blood. Now, uh, he was in the world, and the world failed to recognize. The world just didn't know. It. Didn't give him any place. Even in Israel, he was the stone that the builders rejected. But he was always in the Word. He came unto his own things. It's, it's new. That's why I supply the word things. See, all things are his. And he came to his own things. <clears throat> his own masculine people received him not. Now, that's not Israel. That's mankind. 
All souls are mine, saith the Lord. As the soul of the Father, so also the soul of the Son is mine. The soul that sinned it shall die. That's not Israel. They try to make this Israel. He came to Israel. Israel rejected. Israel did not reject it. If there is anything that an honest student will find if he goes through Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and Acts, is that the people of Israel did not reject the Lord Jesus Christ. They never rejected really anything until they were rejected by something new that came up that called itself Christianity and became the persecutors of Israel. Israel did not reject Christ. The common people heard him gladly. And there was your Israel. Sure the scribes did. Sure the Pharisees did. No doubt about it. But not the common people. They heard him gladly. They followed him. So he came to his own people, mankind. They received him not. But all the way through the Old Testament, Every record we have, as many as received him, to them gave he the right to become the children of God. As many as received him, even to them to believe on his name. Now, go back to your Old Testament. you find one named Abel who received him. And you will find one named Enoch who walked with him. And you will find one named Noah who received him. You will find, if you go on beyond that, you will find one named Abraham. And that started the people of Israel. But at the same time, there was living right there a better man than Abraham named Abimelech. A better man than Abraham. And even though God chose Abraham, passed by Abimelech, to be the head of this new nation, Abimelech was a wonderful man, who, when Abraham deceived him, he was able to go to God and said, "Will you destroy a righteous nation. Of course, these were city-states, and so that nation would have been a city. And he could put it up to God and say, would you destroy a righteous nation? When I did this, that I thought I was doing right, he said this woman was his sister, and I thought I had every right to her. But I haven't touched her. The Lord said, I know this, and I kept you from touching her so that you wouldn't sin against me. And when, Ab when Abimelech called Abraham in, he said, no man ought to do anything like this to another man. That's Abimelech. He was doing all right. Now, from this time on, Let's see a sort of a stage, and Israel fills the stage. You follow to Abraham, who became the father of Isaac. Isaac became the father of Jacob. Begins to branch out with Jacob, he became the father of twelve men, who with some little variation became twelve families. Twelve families became twelve tribes. Twelve tribes made up the nation of Israel, and they fill the stage. They fill the stage, but every time a Gentile gets a little walk-on part. You know what I mean by that? He gets to come on and say a few lines, and he's doing all right. He's doing all right. No doubt about it. Jethro walked on the stage, and Jethro was doing all right. No doubt about it. And you come to Hiram, king of Tyre, ever a lover of David. He was doing all right. Uh, you come uh, to, uh, shall we say, the Queen of the South, a ruler. She ruled a nation called Sheba. Her name was not Sheba. She was the Queen of Sheba. Sheba was a people. Now, the uh, others, you come to the wise men whom they try to say were astrologers and magi. Listen, when you get a thing like that, be simple about it. They were wise because they were wise in the things of God. Where did they get this knowledge? From the light that lighteth every man that cometh into the world. That's where they got it. 
And God spoke to them and told them what this star was and what it represented. And told them to go to the land of Israel. Do obeisance to the king who had been born there. You see this. Cornelius was one of these men. We dealt with him in late this morning. He was one of these men who feared God and who worked righteousness. And he was devout in the sight of God. And oftentimes as the apostles went out to the synagogues, they would find in the synagogues Gentiles who were sick of this incestuous, incestuous idolatry that was practiced in the name of religion. And they would turn their backs against it and want no part of it. And because they could hear the word of God read and it had such wonderful promises for the nations, they'd come up and sit in the synagogue just to hear the word of God read. Not that they could be a part of it. They didn't become proselytes. God didn't want a lot of Gentiles to join up with Israel. They could do all right where they were. But no place in the Word did God ever send out His people and say, go out and make proselytes. People became proselytes. The Pharisees made proselytes. But that's just like the Republicans trying to get Democrats to become Republicans. All the Pharisees wanted was not Gentiles to become Israelites. They wanted Israelites to become Pharisees. That's what they were doing. They weren't missionaries. God didn't intend that Israel be missionaries and carry the light. You can't find that in the book. The church has just made that up. Now, uh, uh, as many as received him, he gave them the right to become the children of God. And all they had to do was believe on his name based upon the light that they had. He that had little and was expected. He that had much light, much was expected. Now we come to the Incarnation. The Word was made flesh. And all we've read so far, we've actually been reading about the one who became flesh and is my Lord Jesus Christ. John says he dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory as the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Now, in due time, the Lord Jesus Christ began his ministry. And as he began his ministry, uh, and John was baptizing, in verse 29, we read, The next day John saith Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. Now I have told you already how that God put air in the world so that it would have something to breathe. How that he put water in the world so that we'd have something to drink. He put the principle of electricity in the world, which is of the utmost importance. And the law of gravitation he put into the world. That's all in the world and a part of our world and it's, it's very good. My glasses would be floating around here. I'd have all of you chasing them. It was not for that good old principle of gravitation. We know that from what the astronauts went through. They had just to nail everything down. could hardly swallow their food because they wanted to come up. And so even gravitation apparently has something to do with the swallowing process, although I grant that the gullet esophagus does have to do with forcing the food on down. But water just drops in almost by itself. Now, the law of gravitation is good, but there was a something in the world that was not good, sin, a principle. Not your sins or my sins, but by one man's sin, a principle, entered into the world. Dr. Carl uh, Messenger, not me. No, Dr. Carl Messenger, Messenger, wrote a book on whatever became of sin. Famous uh, psychologist, psychiatrist, messenger, that's his name. Uh, sound like I got that mixed up. But anyway, you know the book on whatever became of sin. He didn't mean crime out here in the streets. 
But this principle of sin that got in and brought with it death and death passed upon every man. And that death working in man leads men to sin, causes men to sin. So that it has to be said of all, there is no difference. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You want to know how God esteems you in regard to sin? Not as perfect, but you come short of the glory of God. Now, Jesus Christ is the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. A little later, in verse 36, next day John stood with two of his disciples. Verse 36 now. And looking upon Jesus as he walked, said, Behold the Lamb of God. And he was the Lamb of God in relationship to taking away the sin of the world. Then when you come to chapter 3 and verse 17, it says, God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him should be saved. Now, most people are exercised about the ecology. We're all exercised about the water we drink. We're all exercised about the air we breathe. He just destroyed as a world. I don't know enough about it to whether men could destroy the ozone layer. Many scientists believe that he could. So, but God didn't send his son to the world to condemn the world. He sent his son that the world through him might be saved. And we should also remember that uh, this world is savable. It needs saving, and men just can't do it. Because if they do it, they'd have to give up the dollar profit that they make out of the pollution, using our air as a giant cesspool, using our lakes and rivers as a giant cesspool, and so on, using the oceans this way, and it would be so costly, they say, to do anything else. We'll just have to go on and do it. So on and so forth. You've heard all the stories. This world needs saving. But men aren't going to save it. They're in love with the almighty dollar. And they're not going to save it. It's corrupt on every side. Only God can save it. And Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world. There is nothing too hard for my God. And he can save this world, and he is going to save it. Now, one more passage. In the fourth chapter and the fourth verse, the Samaritan said to the woman, Now we believe, not because of your saying, but because we have heard him ourselves, and we know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. Now I want to talk to you for a while about Earth's glorious future. Earth's glorious future. For there is in the doctrine, pardon me, in the Bible, the most definite doctrine of the future of the Earth future of the earth. But if we consider the future of the earth, we must not limit our thoughts just to this planet. We must include in our thinking the world. Mankind is living in the world and upon the earth. And these three must be intertwined in other words, you can't have one without the other, and it'd be any value. But while we need to make clear distinction between them, the earth, the planet, the world, the system, and the inhabitants, we must make clear distinctions. We must keep them locked together when we speak of the future of any one of them. The future of any one of them. 
Now that principle is clearly seen in God's great declaration in Psalm 24, 1, where it says, The earth is the Lord's, and the fullness thereof, the world, and they that dwell there. There's the earth, the world, and its inhabitants. All belongs to the Lord. Now, just keep in mind again that the earth is the planet, the world is the order, the system, the ecology that's upon it. And mankind is the inhabitant to whom the earth was given and for whom the earth was made. The heavens are the Lord's. But the earth is he given to the children of man. Now, there would be no world apart from this planet. No world apart from the planet. And the world is essential to man's well-being. till it's just a part of it. Why, you're made of the very earth that we walk upon. And you go back to soil when they bury you in it. That's how close you're related to the earth. And the very plants that we eat get everything, either from sun, photosynthesis, or the soil itself. Now, uh, there is great anxiety, anxiety among men about the future of the earth, future of the world, and future mankind. <coughs> and predictions are being made that this earth will in time become a lifeless planet. That's the predictions. Destroyed by man himself, while others are assuming that it will be destroyed by God. But this will never be. For we can say with biblical certainty, divine certainty, that concerning the earth, the world, and mankind, not all men, but mankind as such, God has spoken, and their future is glorious. Now we might epitomize the truth of that by saying that the location of the New Jerusalem is in this earth. But that's far off in the future. That final state of things, when the New Jerusalem will descend into the New Earth, something that's so inconceivable, we can't explain it, and God makes no attempt to do so. The reason for that is there's no terms of present experience See, you say to me, a drink of water, and now you're talking to me about a term that I've experienced. I know what you're talking about. You talk about a drink of whiskey, and I wouldn't know what you're talking about. Now, we know that this future will be, and will be glorious, and right there our faith rests. However, before we ever get to the new heavens and new earth, we're going to have a thousand years of the personal presence of Jesus Christ right on this earth. When the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, and so on, and do that in order to be personally present, for us in, for 1,000 years upon the earth. And before that, we have the earth under God's government. The earth when God governs. Three great statements. Now, in the Reformation, certain men like Martin Luther turned their back on Roman Catholic theology to a certain extent. But in the theology that came out of the Reformation, this planet, its world, and mankind and the nations, they were just given no future. No future. In, the, in that theology. Martin Luther, was loath indeed to take up the subject of what we call eschatology, the future, or the last things. And Martin Luther steadfastly refused to give any consideration to the biblical message of future events. And thus it was that with very little modification, the Protestant movement was handed a garbled mass 
of Roman Catholic tradition as to what the future of the earth would be. Now the great John Calvin, who assembled into one body of doctrine all the scattered opinions of the Reformation period, he avoided coming to grips with the great eschatological problems of the Scripture. And so the reformers did very little but generalize about the future. And the reformers left us, the Protestant world, with an almost childish version of things. My father was a devout, consistent Baptist. My mother was a Roman Catholic. And they both believed the very same thing about the future of the earth and the future of the world. They both believed the same thing. When my father became a student of the Word. My mother came to know the Lord. Now here's what the Reformation theology gives. The earth, the world, the nations have no future. All the biblical promises to the earth, the world, the nations, those are explained the speaking of the church in heaven. Say, if it says something wonderful is to be, the inhabitant will not say, I'm sick. Oh, that's the church in heaven. <laughs> that's the church in heaven. Now, I'm not kidding. That's what Moody says in his book on heaven. <laughs> and yet that applies very definitely to the people of the earth. And uh, this is equated with and said to fulfill all the declarations in regard to the second coming of Christ. They did hold to something they called the second coming of Christ. And this was equated with the day of judgment, 24 hours, in which all mankind, past and present, were to be personally assembled. And then these were to be divided into two companies, goats, take the left hand, sheep, take the right hand, Wicked, over here. Righteous, over here. You righteous, go to heaven to be blessed for eternity. You unrighteous, go to hell to be tormented in fire and brimstone and live there forever. That was the Roman Catholic, the Lutheran, the Protestant doctrine of the future. And it's still what most of them believe today. Yes, in the future there was just to be two places good place called heaven, terrible place called hell, where men would be tormented to ever, forever and ever. Then the earth, this planet, all it pertains to it, its fullness, was to be destroyed and go out of existence. That's what we were given. Of course, in that day, men didn't have the Bible. The priest read it in Latin. What they did read was turned to Latin so nobody could understand it. After the Reformation, very few Bibles were available. It wasn't about 200 years ago that the average man, not even the average man could read, but many men could read and begin to say, hey, the Bible says this. The Bible says that. Little by little they begin to get truth out of it. But they stop, they stop, they all stop. Organized people who believe certain things into denominations. Fixed everything so that nobody go beyond that. If you do, you're a heretic. If you stick with it, you're orthodox. That is orthodox Baptist, Lutheran, Methodist. <laughs> now, the translators of the King James Version were rigid followers of the Reformation theology. Get that straight. They followed the Reformation theology. By that I mean the theology that came out of the Reformation. And that's why a simple Greek phrase, maybe not simple to you, but to a Greek student would be, Thaleus tus eonias, meaning the consummation of the eon, they translated this, the end of the world. The word world isn't there, but they made it the end of the world, that's what my father believed. That's what my mother believed. The trumpet was going to sound. 
the world was going to end. And they predicted the end of the world. Halley's Comet. I saw Halley's Comet. Anybody else here see Halley's Comet? Came around in 1910. Uh, Anybody there live in 1910? No? Well, you are you? You live in 1910? Not you, sister. Oh, come on now. Oh, you're just born then. All right. But you came with the comet, huh? I'll go. Well, uh, who else was it that came with the comet? Some famous Mark man. Twain. Who? Mark Twain. Mark Twain was born with the comet. Uh, well, I saw how this comet. I was, I believe, nine years old at the time. And I hope to live to see it again. It comes every 75 years. And I'll be about 85 years of age then. I'm sure I can make that. Uh, my knee might give out, but uh, I don't think the old ticker will. I don't know. Who knows? Thank God we're alive today. We're going to live this day. Well, anyway, when Halley's Comet came around, boy, that was going to be the end of the world. And at that time, due to the awful teaching of sin, terrible teaching that you got, I was scared out of my wits, because <laughs> I knew that I'd stolen some grapes from Mrs. Wall. <laughs> <laughs> well, darn it, they hung over the fence and a hungry boy, what could you expect of? <laughs> and I thought, sure, the world ended, I'd go right to hell, I'd be taking those grapes. <laughs> Well, we'll forget that. Now, what they were doing there was translating their crude concept of the future of the world into the Word of God. And now, many readers of this version suffer the consequences of this corruption of biblical truth, and once each week in Los Angeles we have the end of the world and have to put up with it. <laughs> Every week we have the end of the world. I'm tired of the world ending. I don't know what to do. Then, in the middle of each week, the whole state slides into the Pacific Ocean. And then we have the second coming of Christ so regularly that we just give it up keeping track. Well, now, let me get back and be serious. Even the casual reader of the Bible should be able to see the contradiction and conflict between this, the end of the world, and this, God sent not his Son in the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Also, I came not to judge the world, but to save the world. Furthermore, these inspired words, the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. And another thing, I didn't put that into this manuscript. In the book of Jeremiah, it speaks of world without end. And Matthew speaks the end of the world. Reconcile those two. Reconcile those two. I want the first one, world without end, because that's what the Bible teaches. Now, in view of these statements, we can declare upon the authority of God's Word that this world is savable, that this world is going to be rescued, delivered, and made safe from everything that afflicts. The world also shall be established, Psalm 96.10, that it shall not be moved. You can't all, once God fixed it. And even though a multitude of prophets of doom, both secular and religious, are now armed with scientific opinions and economic tables that declare its early demise, this world is not going to end neither at the hands of men nor at the hands of God. It is going to be rescued and delivered by He who is the Savior of the world, even the Lord Jesus Christ. And in addition to this, it needs to be declared that it is not the message of the Bible 
that this planet's deliverance from the bondage of corruption and the salvation of this world comes only after God has torn the world and its inhabitants to pieces by internecine warfare, nuclear holocaust, and the imaginary revival of a ten-nation Roman Empire. Now all this is dramatically asserted by Hal Lindsey and his sensational book Pardon me. Let me come back. It's asserted by Hal Lindsey and his sensational ghostwriter, Carol Carlson, C.C. Carlson, is Carol Carlson, in their book, The Late Great Planet Earth. Yeah, and you got a ghostwriter to write it, to make it sensational. She's a dramatic writer. We know her. I don't know her personally. Alan Conley knew her in college. He says that she's was not even a believer when she wrote this. Help write it. Now, now this is to be made into a movie. <laughs> and you can see that if this is made into a movie, you know, all of the adults think, boy, now we'll learn the Bible, we can get it in the movie. That's where most of this biblical literacy comes from. Are these crazy movies about it. People think they're getting the Word of God. You see. So as to be made into a movie, this book's claim that the Bible sets for certain signs that are now present and which, quote, herald man's doomsday. This will become more and more the popular delusion of the biblically illiterate masses. Now, as an assiduous Bible student for 57 years, Permit me to say that God's book does not for set forth any signs that heralds man's doomsday, the end of the world, or the extinction of mankind. Furthermore, that which is heralded as the most important sign of oil, I quote from the book, the cover of it, that which is heralded as the most important sign of all, the Jew returning to the land of Palestine, is an event of no present significance whatsoever. That means nothing. Nothing. And I say that as a Bible student 57 years. They're going back. No doubt about it, two million of them. You've got that many, I think, in New York. <coughs> so they're not going back very fast. And a lot of them are getting out of there. Want no part of it. There's an exodus from Israel right now. And uh, I'm not saying anything against the Jews. I'm sympathetic. Nobody can ever accuse me in the least of one grade of anti-Semitism. If so, it was by mistake. By mistake. And one thing that I deplore more than anything else is the anti-Semitism of the Christian people. If you're any part of of hating the Jew just because it's a Jew, let's break fellowship right here and be done with it. I want no help from you. I don't want you associated with my ministry. And don't mention my name in Peoria. In Sheboygan. In Sheboygan. <laughs> <laughs> Kuka, Manga, Azusa, or Al. In other words, don't say you're a friend of mine. If you just have hatred in your heart for the people of Israel. <clears throat> oh, I know some Jew may have done you wrong. I've been done wrong by a lot of Gentiles. And the only persecution I've ever really known, really known, is not from a Jew. No Jews ever persecuted me. Well, I've got this from the so-called Gentile Christians. And they haven't been able to hurt me. Because I don't get in a place where they can hurt me. I don't go through dark alleys when I know that they're there. <laughs> I know. In every prophecy of Israel's return, and I know them all, there's not a prophecy that concerns Israel's return that I'm not familiar with. And every prophecy of their return and restoration, without exception, 
The return is a divine miracle wrought by God alone and it is one of immediate unparalleled blessings for Israel for the world and for mankind. When Israel returns it brings the greatest possible blessings to the world to mankind. The present return of certain Jews to Palestine I don't object. <clears throat> They want to come to Los Angeles, it's all right with me. I'll live right in the midst of them. Get along fine. You ask any of them, they'll speak well of me. I'll also speak well of them. They watch my house when we're gone, I watch their houses. My actual next door neighbor is a Korean. And uh, but the one on the other side, his name's Goldberg, and that isn't Jewish. I don't know what it is. So, they get along good. Now, the present return of certain Jews to Palestine does not fulfill any prophecy in the Word of God. If anyone thinks otherwise, let them point out which one it is. Doesn't do it. All right, let me sum it up. This earth has a glorious future, and its glory could begin before this day is over. The salvation of the world can become a reality within the hour before five o'clock. There is not one thing more that God needs to do but to decree. There is no prophecy that needs to be fulfilled in advance of God assuming sovereignty. Every prophecy and promise in the scripture that is yet unfulfilled will have its final and definitive fulfillment either in one the kingdom of God Two, the great testing. Three, the thousand year policy of Jesus Christ. Four, the little season. Five, the new heaven and the new earth. See issue number 23. The prophesied glorious future of the earth will come about, one, under God's government. One, under the personal presence. Two, under the first presence of Christ. Three, in the new heavens and the new earth. Now, inasmuch as earth's next state is under God's government, Let's look for just a moment at what it will be when Jesus Christ takes to himself his great power and is governing the earth and all men upon. <clears throat> Let's say that God should assume sovereignty among the nations today. By tomorrow, his spokesman, whom he would commission and the world would listen to, the papers would publish his spokesman would be proclaiming among the nations that Jehovah has become king. That he has established the world. That it cannot be altered or shaken. That he will dispense judgment to the peoples with equity. That's the message of Psalm 96. 10. As the Lord judges among the nations and enlightens the people, they will beat their swords into plowshares, there are spears in the pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. This is the message of Isaiah 2.4. Under God's government, great and beneficent physical changes will occur in the earth in harmony with man's needs and man's progress. The Lord will open rivers in high places. That's what he said and fountains in the midst of valleys. He will make the wilderness a pool of water and dry land springs of water. Great amounts of arable land will be added to the earth's surface when the Lord does such things as, I quote, utterly destroying the tongue of the Egyptian sea and men shall go over dry shot and lad land. <coughs> Not just to walk on, but to cultivate. Isaiah 41, 18, 11, 15, give testimony. When God governs the earth, the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the water covers the sea. This is the result of the glory of the Lord having been revealed and all place seeing it in the same amount and at the same time. And because of this knowledge, no one will hurt 
or destroy in all God's holy government, a man can sleep in the wilderness, the uninhabited place, and no man or no animal will ever make him afraid. In that day when God governs, if it's next week, whatever it is, there will be multitudes upon the earth who have experienced death, have been in the state of death, as my own father has been for 30 years, and have come out of it through resurrection. Each one of these will be like a page or a chapter in an encyclopedia that can be turned to for information on any part of history which they have experienced. Old friendships will be renewed, and fellowships that were broken in death can be restored. Numerous writers give witness to this. I give the list. I'll not do it for the sake of time today. True, I have not seen, nor ear heard, Neither have they entered into the heart of men the things which God has prepared for them that love Him. And yet a work of God's Spirit is required if we're going to appreciate earth's glorious future. I'm going to be a part of it. This earth is my hope. That completes my study. I've been long. You've been patient. But you're used to long messages from me. And what are your questions? Where you are. In, um, in the new earth, uh, it's the tabernacle of God, right? That God is dwelling here in the earth. Now, in the parousy of Christ, you have Christ personally present on the earth. Now, the Lord Jesus Christ is God, and I believe that He is, and the Bible says that He is, that uh, how can uh, there be uh, used two different terms when it seems to me that they're both the same uh, it's not the same because one has to do with the set headquarters, which God's headquarters are actually now in heaven. That's why we say our Father which art in heaven. When you get as far as the new earth, not in the power of sin, and you will say our Father uh, which art on earth, because he is on earth. That's the uh, new heavens and new earth, because he'll dwell with men. And his tabernacle, that's tent or headquarters, will be right with men. And this earth will be the mediatorial planet of the universe. When you said that uh, God was in the yard, uh, would you say that that was a physical manifestation of God? No. No. Wouldn't need to be. But he was in the ark. He's in this room, tell the truth. He's in this room. I have uh, been subjected to many people, as I'm sure you have many, many more, uh, with affiliations in various churches, referring to going to heaven upon death, yes. uh, namely uh, absent from the body in Corinthians. Mm -hmm. uh, our conversation is in heaven in Philippians, in uh, the rich man and Lazarus in Luke 16th chapter. But one was pointed out to me the other day, and I'd like to hear your comment on Revelation 19, verse 1. Revelation 19, verse 1. <clears throat> these things I heard the voice of much people in heaven saying hallelujah salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God for true and righteous judgments now if you will look at the Greek of this let me get this before me I would rather be exact here Yes, I got it before me. It is the voice of a vast throng. Now that's the translation. It's not much people. It is a vast throng. The voice of a vast throng. There's no Greek word there for people. And certainly that we know that there's a multitude of uh, angels in heaven. Why? 
I didn't give a chance to look at it. No, but once you look at it, you straighten it up. These people sure have to dig to try to find something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, you think, you know, uh, the word heaven is used in the Hebrew over 400 times. <clears throat> the word uranos is used in Greek 200 times. Shemayim is the Hebrew word for heaven. Uh, all Shemaya means in Hebrew is over and above. It means that in German too. In the German, what is the German word for heaven? Uh, Himmel. 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 The word Himmel is used in German for the roof of the mouth. Over and above. It's a diminutive. A little heaven, it'd say. Uh, forget the ending there. Uh, but uh, it's used for the hard palate, the roof of the mouth. That's called the little heaven. And the vaulted ceiling of a building. Uh, when you have those, it's called the heaven. And uh, uh, heaven means over and above. It's even used of men. Can the heavens give rain, Jeremiah said? He's talking about those kings that they were trying to put their trust in of other nations. They couldn't give any rain. But they were men who were over and above a lot of men. When the gospel was preached to every creature under heaven, it wasn't preached to the American Indians, it was preached to everyone under the Caesars. They were over and above. They were world rulers. They didn't take in the American Indians, but they took in enough. And that's all the word heaven means, is over and above. And it's a descriptive title of God. And on the 4th of July, as we saw the many of the marvelous uh, things, especially here from New York and the uh, New England that was put on the television uh, uh, and uh, we saw those parades and they had the pine tree flag you remember the pine tree flag and some of them said uh, an appeal to God underneath it and the other said an appeal to heaven and on two <coughs> occasions they were asked to explain why some said an appeal to God others said an appeal to heaven said why days the revolution heaven was a synonym for God still is. When you say heaven only knows, that's the name for God. So when you read no man has ascended up into heaven and try to kick Elijah out of there, what it means is no man ascended unto God. I could go to Washington and not see the president. I can easily go to Washington. I can go to Washington before this day is over. But to get in to see the president, that's something else. I can go to London. Can I see the queen? I doubt it. And uh, I don't think that uh, just because Elijah went to heaven that he went in the presence of God but, uh, when he said no man has ascended into heaven he meant no man ascended to God. Prodigal son said I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight. What do you mean? He sinned against the one over and above. Since the Lord was speaking to the Israelites he was a little careful how he used the name of Deity and rightly so. And I've got a man who corresponds to me who is a Hebrew, and he puts G D. You see, that's in the Jewish newspapers too. It's it? supposed to be too holy to say. Or too holy to say, mm -hmm. and that was even more true. They felt more strongly about this. They never said Jehovah. <clears throat> they always substituted that in. Mind. It's not the way they pronounced it, but that's the way it would say. Yes, Lydia. Um, I'm trying to um, trying to get more comprehension about um, the kingdom of God. Um, Glad you were here, brother. Glad you were here. Was wonderful. I, I don't know about it. Yes, you write the door. <laughs> okay. So glad you, you were here. Thank, here. You, yeah. thank you, thank you. Glad you, you so were much. here. Yes. Mm. Mm. <laughs> um, if a person um, acknowledges uh, the existence of God, you know, yes. But um, has heard the um, New Testament, but doesn't um, easily accept the Lord of Christ that David. Would this person still gain the uh, new kingdom? Will he be? Will the person be resurrected? I'll I'll leave God to judge that. It would be up to God to uh, to. Uh, make the judgment in that regard and I would not make it. Uh, 
I wrote this, and I didn't write it, I copied this, in regard to, uh, to uh, judging other men. Every son of man travels an unbeaten path, a road beset with dangers, temptations that no other wanderer met. His footsteps can be judged only in the full knowledge of the strength and light he had, the burden he carried, the obstacles and temptations he met, and a thorough knowledge of every open and secret motive that impelled him. That's the only way I could ever truly judge a man. And I, don't, I think that God would have to look into everything. So, what's the old saying about uh, the Indian said, don't criticize your fellow man till you walked in his uh, moccasins for ten miles or a day. So, uh, Jesus Christ has been here upon earth. Uh, supposing that I had been born in Italy, of good, sound Roman Catholic parents, maybe my father might have been a prince in the church there. And as he had been a prince in the church, by that I mean, not Prince, but uh, <laughs> what, do you, what do you call those fellows that... Uh, well, he might have been a cousin of a Pope, we'll say. And uh, our brother of a Pope. And I've been a nephew. <clears throat> Why, would I want to leave that? And so on. What, what would I do in regard to this? That would have put me in a different situation. I'd never been removed from this. And I would never heard. I would just have been brought up in this from childhood. In the earliest days of my infancy. I wouldn't want to undertake the judgment of anyone like that. And so we'll just have to leave such a one to God. Such a one to God. I am awfully distressed about these uh, Jehovah Witness children that are brought up in these families and are taught to depreciate and put down Jesus Christ as next to nothing. You can forget about him if you're a Jehovah Witness. Just forget about him. He's no more important than Napoleon or anyone else uh, just a character in history and it, it, it troubles me but I leave it to God even if you could reach them they're so completely brainwashed it'd almost take you a lifetime to even to rinse it out one of their little children just died over in England I read it in the Times about two months ago yes no blood transfusion mm -hmm. well we'll take the offering I get my very special basket ready here. <laughs> I will take this opportunity to thank every one of you for being here and for making the conference possible. I come here to teach you because you want to be taught. Uh, because I believe that your questions are honest. I believe they're sincere. And if anybody did ask a question just to put me on the spot, that'd be all right. I've never been off the spot all my life, so. And I put myself on the spot more than anyone else ever has when it comes to biblical questions. <coughs> And, uh, but I appreciate your questions, and I'll appreciate it most if you'll respond to the effort I put forth by turning to this word as you have never turned before, incorporating it into your life and into your practice. Now, don't get all hung up on every detail of right and wrong like the preachers do, you know. Uh, probably the greatest, biblical, the greatest biblical principle in the world is this, but it's all lost in a miserable translation where it says, abstain from every appearance of evil. That's the way the King James says it in Ephesians. Uh, no, not Ephesians. Thessalonians. 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 What that actually says is, abstain from everything that is evil to the perception. You can see it's evil. Perception. You can see it's evil. You can see this is wrong. You know it's wrong. It's not good. It's bad. It's state. You do that. I don't think God would 
require much more. That's what I want to do. It's not trying to find some split the hairs, you know, is, is this right, is this right? Do we put the, uh, raise the right hand when we pray or do we raise the left hand? <laughs> do we raise both? <laughs> do we put mud on the eyes when we pray for the man? Or do we say, no, sir, that's wrong? Do we belong to the mudites or the anti mudites? <laughs> Don't get into all those things. You just, you just wear your life out. It'll be gone. It'll be gone. God's given you a man to keep. And you'll have to be maybe like the fellow said, and while thy servant was busy here and there, he got away. So watch out that man doesn't get away that God gave him to keep. And everything wasted. That's what the old pappy says. Fatherly advice. Well, that's everything for this, this conference.